We have a, a, a special guest now with an exclusive, uh, Mia Maria Pope, who is uh, who lived in Honolulu, who is a um, contemporary of the Mac Daddy Obama. She knew him as Barry Satoro. Mia, are you there? Yes, sir. I am here. Well, first of all, we thank you for uh, calling us today and informing us of this information you have as a personal reference of Obama. Could you just kind of yes. write it down and tell us how you knew him? What was some of your participation or actions or interactions with him? Okay, I'm happy to. And uh, thank you for having me on, Dr. Manning. Um, I really admire your good work you're doing. I uh, was born in 63. Uh, my family, I was born in California. My family moved to Waimanalo, Hawaii when I was a young infant. So all of my formative, formative years were spent in Waimanalo, Hawaii, which is on the island of Oahu. And uh, I knew of this individual. His name was Barry Sotoro. And he uh, always portrayed himself as a uh, foreign student. And we just, that didn't mean much to me then, but you know, that's just what we knew about him. And uh, he wasn't really close within my particular um, circle of friends. He was a little bit older than me. Um, and he very much was within sort of the gay community, which there is a thriving, even back then, gay community in that area, particularly the Diamond Head area. And we knew Barry as just common knowledge that, you know, he, girls were never anything that he was ever interested in. And, you know, as a young teenager, you know, as a young girl, I mean, it was clear to me that Barry was strictly into men. And, um, you know, not that I had any designs on him or anything. I mean, he and I really didn't even get along because one of the his attributes that's still evident today is that he was even a pathological liar back then. <laughs> and it was, and I'm not, yeah, it, 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 and I'm not kidding. I mean, every time this guy would open his mouth, the most outlandish stories would come out of his mouth. And so pretty soon we would just, we, I actually, you know, I'm, I'm going back over 30 years here, but I remember us saying, you know, like, Barry, don't you ever get tired of lying? You know, he was a pathological liar even then. You know, I have very clear image memories, but it was, it was always something to egotistically boost himself, that it was always something how he was, you know, he had this, he had this weird air where, like, he used to go around bumming cigarettes from people. Which, you know, I think we all did, but the thing was with him is he would turn it on, try to, like, see if he could get something off of you type thing, and then as soon as you'd be stupid enough to get a hand on a cigarette, he'd snap in an instant and walk away as if <laughs> it was like insult to injury, you know what I mean? So he didn't actually have a lot of friends or anything, really. He was just in the periphery, and I had some gay acquaintances, and remember... You know, this is the late 70s. I mean, drugs were around, and, um, you know, that lifestyle was just starting to really come to the forefront. And as far as people were very out front with their personal behavior, he just was seen to be incapable of being genuine or telling the truth about anything. So that kind of turned us off. But, you know, we were young teenagers, we we're naive. It's kind of like, all right, yeah, bury the liar, whatever. And then. Um, but we, one thing that he did brag about, now remember this is the late 70s, this is before crack was invented, or if it was invented, we never saw it around. I never heard of it until the 80s. So this was, um, if you were going to do cocaine, it was like in the powder form, and it was very expensive. Well, here we are, a bunch of broke teenagers, and, you know, there, in other words, for somebody to brag that they have this cocaine was, you know, somewhat newsworthy within our little clique. And he would sort of, he would, and then this he probably was telling the truth. He would get with these older white gay men, and this is how we just pretty much had the impression that that's how he was procuring his cocaine. In other words, he was having sex with these older white guys, and that's how he was getting his cocaine to be able to freebase. But that wasn't the nature only, I mean, his, his lies would be just mundane thing. I mean, in other words, if he told you the sun was shining, you better go out and check. 
okay, well, one, I'm a Christian, and I, I'm a, I care deeply about my country, so there's a certain anger that is within me about this individual destroying my country, so he's not on my Christmas list, and so I, I don't like the guy. And, I mean, if he was doing a good job, regardless of what his past was, I wouldn't be on the phone with you today, but... What I uh, and why why me as opposed to someone else? I would just simply say maybe courage. I've gotten to a point in my life where it turns my stomach when people take the low road and don't stand up and tell the truth and um, maybe you know just just be out front like like what you do, Doctor Manning. I mean, what you do is courage and you stand up and you tell it and it's righteous. Uh, at at first, you did not have any calls to uh, to come forward, and as much as that, perhaps exactly. he might have done some Precisely. good things. Precisely. Like, had I had a photograph or a video, I would have immediately, like, coveted that and then waited to see it. I, I would have leaked that sort of thing. Unfortunately, I never, I don't have a video or a picture. So that's part of, as I started to wake up about Barry Sotoro, and it kind of kept me behind because I was I actually called the FBI several times exposing his using fake social security numbers and they did nothing and I told them about my past nobody ever called me back nobody ever wanted to get any further information so I felt that I was being stonewalled and this is several years ago I'm talking about that I contacted the FBI so um, nobody was interested in my story so that's part of it and then um, when he very first came on the scene, I scratched my head thinking, has he really changed his ways? You know, in my head thinking, you know, could this be the same guy that I remember? Because I remember this guy as low road, you know, guy. In other words, you wouldn't trust this guy to walk your dog. <laughs> and I thought, really? You know, this guy, and so I'm kind of waiting to see what he's doing and well, let so, me ask you this question. You know, because it's not, in other words, I have gay friends. I don't, I don't care that he's gay. I don't care even that he smoked prolifically uh, free-based cocaine in the 70s. I was sort of waiting to see what sort of adult he was. When Larry Sinclair, so, when Larry Sinclair uh, publicized and had a press conference indicating he had had uh, a sexual, homosexual relationship with Obama, uh, and that uh, that they both smoke crack cocaine. Um, mm -hmm. This was before the election. No one mm -hmm. really paid it any attention or paid Larry any attention. I want to come back to that. But let me just ask another question. I think it's probably more important. Sure. Uh, you, I noticed you say with emphasis Barry, Barry Satoro, and that would be the way you remember him because that's who he was and we all know that who he, that's who he was when he was in, in Hawaii. He goes to Occidental Correct. and at some point between Occidental and the next time we see him his name is Barack Hussein Barack Obama. Obama. Right. Uh, when which which cracked me up I thought it was hilarious so uh, Why? and then that Why do you is think also another indicator to me like something shady here is like what's really going on with this guy. As far as you know, I understand. I, I am familiar with the uh, Larry Sinclair story, and I am here to tell the listening audience that Barry Sotoro was smoking a cocaine pipe long, long before Larry Sinclair. Why do you Thank think you his grandmother me? never publicly endorsed him, said anything yeah. at all about him? Why do you yeah. think that's so? I mean, you may not know the family. You probably didn't get a chance he's to know the family. He's a shameful individual. I mean, he, he's, if, I mean, he know, she must have known what you and I know, and now your listening audience knows. This guy is not, I don't want to say foul words, you know, but this guy is like that kind of, you know, he's a scumbag kind of guy. You know yeah, what I mean? Well, he's he not is. A, no, he is. he's proud of. There's no doubt about right. that. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I was familiar with the apartment building that his grandparents lived in, and that was off of Barakania. This is in Honolulu, Hawaii. Now, you know, Waikiki is just an area where us kids used to hang out, but I have, I have had ties to Punahou through friends and things like that, and I'm familiar with the apartment building that his grandparents lived in. And it's just a simple uh, walk-up. It didn't look like these people had any kind of money whatsoever. And that was another thing that struck us, like, how do you live there 
and go to Punahou, which is a really expensive school. And I mean, like, even back in the day, it was something on the order of six or seven hundred dollars a month in seventies dollars. I mean, it's a big, you know, a big a tuition to go to that school. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, and and also it's very difficult to get in at mid level, meaning that that school, unless you have something stellar going on with you, they'll only accept you if you start out in kindergarten. So, to for him to have you know, come from Indonesia at whatever age, and I didn't know him then, when he was fresh from Indonesia. Uh, but to have come over at that age and then just get inserted into Punahou, let me tell you, and I'm no stranger to Punahou, that is very unusual. Well, why do you think that um, Obama's cocaine use, his drug use, uh, and that he was having experiences with older uh, were they white men, businessmen uh, in the Honolulu area? Uh, well, I shouldn't say, why do you think? Do you think that his entrance into Punahou, Punahou could have been... Punahou. Punahou yeah. could have been the influence of white businessmen or homosexual or gay co group inside that school? Because I was concerned about how he could come from, from Jakarta and, and, and uh -huh. an Islamic uh, culture mm -hmm. at the age of 10 mm -hmm. years old and immediately transition into one of the more exclusive right. schools uh, in America it, at, at the time. Exactly. I, you know, I, and you know, I, now as a grown adult, I can look back and I would have to say that there had to have been some type of, I'm going to say CIA because I don't know any other agency that would, you know, get involved in these sorts of things. But I don't know anything like that as a fact. But something or some force got this guy set up. I mean, it was certainly not a natural thing. So I don't know who, what fifth column or shadow government or whatever was responsible for his entree onto that scene, but something unusual had to have happened. In other words, he wasn't just some guy out of nowhere filling out an application from Indonesia and then Punahou said, welcome. That wouldn't have happened. Yeah, I, we, could, we could be clear about that. So that, that def And that has, hap that has been the trend, uh, Mia, from Punahou to Occidental, allegedly yeah. to Columbia and also to Harvard. Right. And, I right. and no one ever saw him at Columbia. Remember, we have people who were in the same class, supposedly, majored in political science, which was supposedly Barry's exact major, and they went around and interviewed every single member of that student body, and not a one, not one person ever saw him at that school. Have you had any contact with any of the other people that used to hang out with you down at Waikiki that also yeah. are, ob are observing Obama and they're am amazed yeah. at what he has done, the lies yeah. that he has told, and he is a yeah. liar, uh, no doubt about oh, that. He's a drug liar. use, he's a sexual pervert as well. He is a pervert. Because we only have a few moments left, I want to ask you about his moving to Chicago. There were two deaths in Chicago that the world has let go by. One was Donald right. Young. The other was Nate Spencer, and there was a, a three, actually three deaths, uh, and the third person's mm -hmm. name escapes me right now. I know Larry that, Bland. Larry it's Bland, that's Larry right. Larry yes. Bland. And all three of those uh, individuals were murdered within days of each other. This same Obama that used to hang out, smoke dope, freeload mm -hmm. cigarettes, uh, try to yeah. put a try to put a thrill on you, try to put a Mac on you if he wanted yeah, something from exactly. you. Exactly. And at the moment he got he, he got what he wanted, he dropped the Mac game and he dropped, dropped the Mac immediately. But and that a, was the thing that he was, was a like good Mac daddy. He, he knew yeah. how to Mac back in the 1970s. He knew how to Mac. Correct. He knew that game Correct. perfectly. Correct. Do, do, have you had an opportunity to see the picture of him in drag on YouTube? Yeah, there's a picture of him in drag with and and a leather outfit that has that's really revealing more flesh. And the only place it covers up is his genitals, but everything else is fully exposed. It looked like some sort of a sadistic outfit. I've seen that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and those boots he's wearing are in a man's size. So, for anybody out there that thinks that maybe he drugged this out of his mother's closet on a dare or something, remember he had to have those boots specially made because they're in a man's size. But I actually saw Barry not in that outfit, and I wasn't present while that picture was taken. So I actually saw him 
in other attire similar to that picture that you've just described. 